The vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel. But yesterday morning, in the wee hours of Sabbath rest, brutal warfare was unleashed against Israel on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. It is the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, which nearly destroyed the ancient people and new state of Israel. And now, genocidal war crimes have been committed against Israeli civilians who were deliberately targeted in the street and in their homes for abduction and torture and murder. Thousands of rockets have been fired into residential neighborhoods and apartment blocks because the Palestinian terrorists who are waging this unholy war want to kill as many civilians as possible. And their atrocities have been financed, organized, and armed by the Islamic Republic of Iran. If this were happening in the United States, as a proportion of our population to Israel's, today we would have 20,000 dead. So, to pray for those who have died and the many more who are gravely wounded or held captive and those who will be in harm's way in the days ahead, let us now keep a moment of silence. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Amen. The Solemnity of Christ the King is the last Sunday of the liturgical year, and that is only seven weeks from today. The gospel on each Sunday remaining in this old year of grace is taken from the latter chapters of St. Matthew, which contain parables of the kingdom of God and focus on the conflict between the Lord Jesus and the religious authorities in Jerusalem. In those chapters, the Lord Jesus teaches that no one will come to the eternal kingdom of God because of his ancestry, ethnicity, wealth or position in life. And no one will come to the kingdom because he belongs to the right group or has esoteric knowledge or holds the right political opinions or a good reputation or possesses any human quality prized by the world. No, if we come to the kingdom at all, we come only at the gracious invitation of the king, a call that came first to Israel through the covenant the law and the prophets, and comes now for all peoples only from Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews and the King of all creation. Last Sunday we heard the Lord Jesus tell the priests and elders that tax collectors and prostitutes would come to the kingdom of heaven before them. Christ taught the leaders of the temple that sinful outcasts received the preaching of John the Baptist and were changed by the word of God, while they, the religious authorities, rejected John's preaching and remained impenitent. And today we hear the Savior warn the same priests and elders that the kingdom of God will be taken away from them and given to others who will live according to the truth of God's holy word. In the verses that follow just after today's passage, verses which are not included in our lectionary reading, we discover that when the priests and elders heard the parables of Jesus and understood that he was talking about them, they were enraged and wanted to arrest and kill him. But they did not do so at that time because they were afraid of the crowds that followed Jesus, afraid that they would turn on them. Recall that in Matthew's Gospel, these parables about the kingdom are found for narrative reasons in Holy Week, 
and the preaching of the Lord Jesus on the kingdom of heaven leads directly to his betrayal, torture, and death. Such are the stakes for understanding correctly what the kingdom of heaven is and is not, and how we get there. When his disciples asked the Lord Jesus to teach them to pray, he told them to say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, having citizenship in the kingdom requires us to live in keeping with the holy will of God. And living in perfect harmony with God is possible only when we conform our wills to his in every way. But friends, that is something we can do only if we live in the freedom of the children of God, a freedom that comes only from the obedience of faith in Jesus Christ. And that obedience is not in any way a restriction of our freedom, but is in fact the true source and guarantee of all authentic personal liberty. And this is where the image of the kingdom of God can be problematic for us. In our experience of earthly kingdoms, when any king demands that his subjects accept his will in all things, there is always tyranny, misery, and bloodshed. But we speak of the kingdom of God as we speak of all things divine only by analogy, meaning that we compare two things that are not the same. And so in every analogy there is greater dissimilarity than similarity. Living in the eternal kingdom of God is not an experience of tyranny because once we have been liberated from slavery to sin and death by the way, the truth, and the life, then we discover that we can live in keeping with our true purpose for the first time. And that is when we discover that holiness of life is not oppression of any kind, but is instead the fulfillment of our nature and leads to perfect happiness. You see, the will of God is made known to us by the Logos to Theou, the Word of God, or even the reason of God. And so our acceptance of God's will is never a matter of simple submission as it is in Islam. The omnipotent Word of God designed and made us as rational persons to share his glory forever. And he calls us to that life of love by teaching us to know and live in eternal goodness, truth, and beauty. The law of Sinai was given to the children of Israel through Moses to teach them how to live in freedom. But living in freedom from sin was then, is now, and always will be beyond the power of any human person acting without the grace of God. Because of man's fall from grace, We simply cannot live in holiness by our own efforts. And so our lasting liberty could never be found in the law itself. Instead, only Christ Jesus has the power to liberate us from slavery to sin by grace, through faith, hope, and love. And for that purpose, the word became flesh and dwelt among us to teach us and to heal us and to offer us the grace of salvation. And that grace requires of us the willingness to be converted from sin, which is why Christ's public ministry began with this proclamation. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. But the chief priests and elders were not yet ready to hear and heed that proclamation because they were smugly confident in their own purity. And such self-righteousness always leads to spiritual arrogance, to sterility, and to death. That is why the children of Israel so often went astray from the covenant and failed to live in keeping with the law and the prophets. And in the first lesson today from the prophet Isaiah, we read about what happens when any person or people live in contradiction to God's plan for human life. Isaiah sings with delight that the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his cherished plant. And yet because of their disobedience to God's law and love, 
the chosen people produced over and over, not an abundance of grapes for making the wine of delight, but only wild fruit suitable for the bitter vinegar of decadence and destruction. The result of this corruption was that the vineyard of the Lord was exposed to the depredations of the world. That vineyard was ravaged by the boar of the forest and fell into ruin. And that is why the Lord Jesus uses the image of a vineyard and wine press in his parable of the kingdom. The chief priests and elders who heard him would have known Isaiah's text intimately, as well as that of Psalm 80, which sings of God transplanting a vine from Egypt, a reference to the exodus of Israel and a foreshadowing of the Son of God coming to the land of promise out of Egypt. And yet the vineyard in Christ's parable is taken for granted by the tenants who are stewards only and not owners. In their insolence, the tenants disregard both the rights of the owner and his plans for their welfare. And then they conspire to steal what is not theirs through crimes that only escalate into ever greater violence and degradation, culminating in killing the Lord's own son, the one who is the true heir of the vineyard. Such arrogant presumption is how we make ourselves unfit for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that is why the kingdom will always be taken from the self-righteous and given to those who, like the tax collectors and prostitutes from last week, will hear and heed the gospel. And in saying this, the Lord Jesus also foreshadows the wild shoot of the Gentiles being grafted on to the olive tree of Israel so that the church becomes on earth the seed and beginning of the eternal kingdom of God. So, if we hope to live forever in the kingdom of heaven, we must understand that repentance and belief in the gospel are the essential means of our being united to the one alone who can bring us into that kingdom of glory, the one alone who is both God and man, the one alone who is the savior of the world, the stone rejected by the builders who has become the cornerstone, the true vine of whom we are but branches, the one who is both the king of the Jews and the king of all creation, the Lord, Jesus Christ,